recognize this year's recipient of the Reverend Joseph C. Bartley OSA Alumni Medallion. This award uh, recognizes alumni who have distinguished themselves in their careers, demonstrated service to their communities, and extraordinary service to the Villanova School of Business in Villanova. It is the highest distinction bestowed to a VSB alumni. Named after the Reverend Joseph C. Bartley, OSA, the award recipient embodies the Augustinian ideals of veritas, unitas, caritas, truth, unity, and love. Father Bartley's life and ministry are remembered as more than just the name of the building here on campus. He was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1893. He entered St. Rita's Hall, the House of Postulants, in 1909 and was received into the novitiate in 1912. After completing his collegiate and theological studies at Villanova, he was ordained to the priesthood at St. Charles Seminary in 1919. He received his PhD in economics in 1922 and for the next 40 years was associated with Villanova College. In 1928, when he, he then became the uh, School of Commerce, when the School of Commerce and Finance was first established, he became its first dean. He held his position until his death at the age of 69 in 1962. From 1928 to 1962. <clears throat> he is buried on campus near the St. Thomas of Villanova Church in Bartley Hall, now the Villanova School of Built this building, his name and his honor. At this time, I would like to invite the Reverend Peter M. Donahue, OSA, Villanova University President, and George Cobb, Associate Vice President for Alumni Relations, to join me on stage. Daniel J. Hogarty Jr., the leader in the banking industry, is the retired chairman, president, and CEO of the Troy Savings Bank and the Troy Financial Corporation. He currently serves as the president and director of the Troy Savings Bank Charitable Foundation and the Troy Savings Bank Music Hall Foundation. He is also director, treasurer, and chairman of the finance committee of the University of Albany Foundation and a trustee of the New York State Teachers Retirement System and a director of the Troy Municipal Assistance Corporation. Dan has given tirelessly to his community, serving on a number of educational and nonprofit boards, including the Arsenal Partnership, Hudson Valley Community College, the Sage Colleges, Maria College, LaSalle Institute, LaSalle School for Boys, the Center for Economic Growth, and the Community Hospice. Dan has received numerous awards, including the Business Review Executive of the Year, the Jewish National Fund Tree of Life Award, the YMCA President's Award, the Arthritis Foundation Accolade for Service Award, the YMCA's President Award, and many more. Dan has been a loyal and dedicated Villanova alumnus for the past 52 years. He has enjoyed a long and distinguished career in banking and has served his community well. I came to know Dan through his involvement in the very early stages of the Center for Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship. He served as a key advisor in shaping the Center's mission and strategy and was a strong proponent of mine. He's just an incredible partner and, and, a, and a terrific person, all wrapped in one. He provided generous, generous seed money to the ICE Center, which allowed the center to establish itself and grow its program in the business school. And now it is a program that touches thousands of students across our campus every year. Both he and Ellen have been wonderful ambassadors for Villanova, and I'm, I'm personally grateful. It really is an honor to, to bestow this award upon both. As Dan's walking to the stage, uh, I would ask to, to give him a little bit of a round of applause. Please come on. Oh, 
cool. It's cool. Anyway, we're not going to leave. It's all about you. Okay? It is my distinct pleasure and pride that I present the 2013 Reverend Joseph C. Bartley OSA Alumni Medallion to Daniel J. Coker. Coming to Villanova in 2008 as the director of the Ice Center, Cool Center. <laughs> and now the dean of the Villanova School of Business, you have contributed significantly to the learning experiences of students in preparing them for the challenges and opportunities of a global business environment. I think of Pat, though, as deserving of an additional official times. In addition to being the dean, he's the CEO, CIO, and the CCO. CEO is not the usual chief executive officer. It's the chief entrepreneurial officer. The CIO is not the chief investment officer. It's the chief innovation officer. And CCO is the chief creative officer. Thank you very much, Pat, for your friendship and your leadership. Father Peter, thank you very much for your leadership, your vision, and your accomplishments, and your commitment to excellence as proclaimed in your 10-year strategic plan. Villanova will seek to achieve an unprecedented level of distinction while remaining true to its Catholic and Augustinian values. You go along in achieving your goals, and that, that is that Villanova in education would be undisputably recognized as one of the best in the world. Now that the business school is known for its emphasis and for innovation and creativity, I can picture a BSB student embracing the life of an entrepreneur. Their goal would be to create value in themselves by gaining knowledge through the dedicated teachings and outstanding by the outstanding faculty and through their experiences in and out of the classroom. Just like any startup or new venture, there's a need for capital. And the faculty and the administration transfer their capital, that is, their intellectual capital, knowledge to the students. And when it comes time to graduate, the BSB student is ready for what is sometimes referred to as commercialization. It's similar to a new product or a service that is value and is well capitalized. They have a word that's attractive, in the global economy, and they can continue to be creative and innovative. They actually have added value because they're Villanovans and they possess the Augustinian of Unitas, Veritas, and Caritas, truth, unity, and love. I'm a firm believer that St. Augustine and Thomas of Villanova watch over and pray for all Villanovans. Some need a little more watching and prayer I know I did. And I will always be grateful to Father Thomas Burke 
a very optimistic Augustinian priest, for giving me the opportunity to enroll in Illinois. The honor, of course, is also very important because it represents Father Joseph C. Barclay's values and his vision and his commitment to the success of the business students at the university. Barclay Hall was under construction when I came here in 1957, and there was a temporary building that was used to house the CNF students. And the freshmen, uh, we all had the same curriculum at the time, so they divided half of us went in the morning and half of us went in the afternoon. Father Barclay was a, was a remarkable and wonderful man, having served as the dean for, for so many years. And he was an important advisor to the presidents of the Villanova University. He devoted his entire Augustinian life to Villanova. Pat, thank you very much for introducing my family. I'm so happy that they're able to be here uh, with me tonight. Helen and I, we participated in community activities and are involved in charitable, cultural, and organization, cultural and educational organizations have been an integral part of our life. And we've been marriage partners for 49 years, and we've met many wonderful people and uh, through our association and community organizations. Thank you, Owen, I'm very grateful for your support and your participation. I began my banking career in 1964, and because of banking regulations and restrictions at that time, there was very little opportunity to be creative or innovative. There were limits on the rate of interest that could be paid to depositors and the rates that were charged to borrowers. But that all changed in 1965 when Citibank, the world's largest bank, created the certificate of deposit. Very creative and innovative. A year later, a small savings bank in Massachusetts created a now account because savings banks weren't allowed to offer checking accounts. The rest is history as to what banks and what banks cannot do. So it really doesn't matter whether you're big or whether you're small. To be innovative and creative, if they become part of your culture. The most important part of the Troy Savings Bank's mission statement was our commitment to combine tradition with innovation to better serve the bank's clients, the community, and the shareholders. Now we're all anxious to hear Bill McDermott, and I would like to conclude by saying how honored I am to be this year's recipient of the Reverend Joseph C. Bartley Medallion. And I wish to thank the selection committee and thank Madonna for making tonight a wonderful evening for everyone. My best wishes to Bill McDermott. this summer when he started his uh, Twitter Twitter feed and 
That's not as big of an issue for me as the fact that I'm following him, but he doesn't seem to be following me <laughs> on Twitter. So we're hoping to, to solve that problem, but uh, he didn't make quite a splash. Uh, the bill needs SAP's 67,000 employees and 250,000 customers in 188 countries. With a vision to make the world run better and improve people's lives, SAP achieved annual revenue of 16 billion euros in 2012. 63% of the world's financial transactions touch an SAP system, and 98% of the world's most valuable brands run SAP software, including Wawa, by the way, as Chris Dyson told us. Yeah. 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 Before joining SAP, Bill served in senior technical roles with Seidel Systems and Gardner Incorporated. He spent 17 years at Xerox Corporation, where he progressively rose through the ranks to become the company's youngest corporate officer and division president. He's a member of several external boards, um, including Under Armour, as a matter of fact. And in 2013, he and co-CEO Jim Snay were ranked number two on Glassdoor.com's list of the top 50 highest rated CEOs, based on their 99% approval rating from employees. He holds an MBA in business management from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. Apparently, he couldn't get into Villanova. <laughs> we won't hold it against him. And he received his bachelor's degree in business management from Dowdy College. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Bill McMahon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be before Bill begins, and I hope he doesn't mind, but uh, we do have the best students in the world, I would say. I think we can all agree on that, Bill. That's why I wanted to get you up here first, but I already said that. <clears throat> Many of them have become interns and full-time employees at SAP, and one of the things that Bill uh, promotes and fosters is that, uh, amongst his young employees is that they step up. It's very consistent with our entrepreneurial viewpoint that our students and our, the folks here on campus need to step up and need to be entrepreneurial and say what's on their mind. So I would encourage those of you who are interned at SAP to step up and talk to Bill McDermott right now. There we Thanks. go. There we go. So. Are you telling me that we have some interns that are actually going to step up here tonight? We do. Can I just say two things before we get started? One is, Dan, what a life, what a winner, what a man of character and class and poise. What a beautiful conversation you just had with us. Thank you so much. Beautiful. 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 And I would also like to say, Pat, I'm convinced now that you guys really are cool. You know, there's something very cool about yes. Center right. But Father Peter, also warm and fuzzy. So, I think Villanova has struck, struck the right balance of cool, warm, and fuzzy. So, Father Peter, an honor to be with you. What an unbelievable job you're doing with this university, and a great pleasure spending time with you tonight. And Pat, congratulations so on all the successes you're enjoying here at Villanova. Go Wildcats, man. Way to go. Thank Give you. it up. Give it up. Thank you. So, okay, so Pat, you took out the challenge. What interns want to ask the first question? Who do we got? Hey Bill, thanks for coming. Bring it on. Uh, my name Introduce is, yourself. My name is Liam Miller. Okay. Oh. <laughs> my name is Liam Miller. I interned in Palo Alto this summer. I had a great time. As a matter of fact, I think we started out in the same industry, the best industry in the world, delicatessens. <laughs> Although I didn't go on to buy the deli that I worked at, I learned a lot of good lessons there. What lessons did you learn at the deli that you worked at and went on to buy that you bring to SAP today? Well, first of all, thank you for the question. I'm, I'm glad to see your pedigree is as strong as mine. <laughs> yeah. If you can make it in the deli, you can make it anywhere. Exactly. And Chris, I lucked out because in my younger years, I only had to go against 7-Eleven. If I had to go against Wawa, we'd have been in trouble. <laughs> but I do really want to answer that question because I actually think if I was um, putting together a story tonight, I would say everything I needed to know, I learned in that delicatessen. I traded in three part-time jobs for one full-time job at the deli. I bought it for 5,500 in notes, which means you're too broke, you don't have any money, but somebody's crazy enough to give you a loan. And the deal was this, I give you 7,000 with interest back in 12 months, or you get the store back, real simple. Now, we talked about leadership and collaboration and innovation as the topics for tonight. So here's the idea. Collaboration came in real handy because I didn't have any money to buy the stock. So I had everybody give it to me on consignment. And I told them, I'll never shop you. You can charge me a little too much. 
and I'll always owe you for the original delivery at the end. Win-win. Innovation was kind of interesting because in that era, it was the breakthrough of video games. So if you remember Asteroids and Pac-Man, anybody out there? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Well, one day I was going through the mall and I saw these kids popping mom and dad's quarters in these video game machines. So I looked at the back of the machine, I got the owner's name, I called them up. And I said, how do I get hold of one of these machines? And in true New York tradition, give me 5,000. I said, I don't have 5,000. Give me 4,000. I, I don't have 4,000 either, but I have an idea. What about you give me the machine? I'll build a game room in the deli and we'll split the quarters. Well, that's exactly what we did. And the deli was paid off in three months on those quarters. Wow. Now, the best idea on the leadership side, and this is the most important thing I learned, is all about the customer. And I'll give you an example. You know, when you, when you have a lot of money, you figure it out, man, you find a way. So my winning dream was to beat 7-Eleven and keep everyone from going to the supermarket to come to my little store. So I learned quickly, if you're little, you can't win on price. I thought I'd discount milk and get them all in my store and then upsell them on all the other stuff. Well, they came and got the milk and left. <laughs> Didn't work. 7-Eleven, if I put on a sale, just put on a better sale. So I had to focus on what I can do. And I realized that I was in the customer service business. So here was the idea. My base wasn't guys in ties, it was blue collar workers. I give them credit, little notebook, they're rich on Friday, they're broke by Saturday night, I give you credit all week long. <laughs> and they'll always pay you back. Senior citizens, what do we know about senior citizens? They don't want to leave the house, we deliver. And then the hard problem to solve was the high school kids. Because 7-Eleven, you'll love this Chris, they were right next door to the high school. I was a block and a half down the street. How do I get those kids to walk past 7-Eleven to come to my store? So I went and asked the kids, and I noticed they're all waiting on line to get into 7-Eleven. I'm like, the store's huge. It's got all this space. Why are you all waiting on line? Well, they don't trust us. They think we're going to take stuff. So they make us wait on line four at a time, and no more than four in the store at a time. I'm like, aha, you can come down to my store, come in 40 at a time. To underscore the power of relationships and trust, I'll never forget having 40 in the store at one time, you know, feeding them lunch, having the game rooms popping off with sounds of asteroids and Pac-Man, and one kid saying to me, hey, bro, when we want to be treated with dignity and respect and have good food and have a good time, we come here. And when we want to steal stuff, we go to 7-Eleven. <laughs> That's what I learned. Okay? That's what I learned. And, uh, you know, I'm very happy to talk to Chris tonight because I understand Wawa has already taken care of 7-Eleven in this area. So, hats off to Wawa. All right. Thank you very much, Liam. And keep up the good work. Thank you. Next question. Hello. Hello, my name is Genevieve Weigert, and I interned down in Town Square, where you work over the summer. And I know you started your career at Xerox, and you started at the bottom doing task-based work, day-to-day -day work, and progressed to management as you moved through, up the ranks to managing people. How did you stay connected to the core of the business and collaborate with those who you were leading? Well, thank you very much for the question. Maybe I could just give you a little bit of, of my history. I lived in a house in Amityville, Long Island, and the house was on a concrete slab. So when you had a northeast storm or something, the house, my mother, God rest her soul, the house flooded. And there were many occasions where we have three or four feet of water in, in the house. And on this one day, the day I was going in to the Xerox Corporation to interview for my big job, I had my $99 suit that I bought at the mall and a flood that was three and a half feet deep in the ground level of my house, which meant my younger brother, who's much stronger than me, took me off the fourth stair coming down to the second floor and carried me to the street and poured me into my father's car. And I went to Long Island Railroad to take my drive on the railroad to Xerox. But before getting out of the car, I looked at my father, I thanked him for taking me, and I guaranteed him that I would come home that night with my employee badge from Xerox Corporation in my pocket. That day, I get there, 
I show up and I'm like lined up, and I went to a small school in Long Island, so I could work in the deli and do school at the same time. And I'm seeing these kids, they look polished. You know, they look like they're straight out of Brooks Brothers, the mother and the father, probably big executives and stuff. So I said, I'm in trouble here. I got my $99 suit from the mall, and these guys are ready to go. I said, well, improvise. I got a dream, man. What is their dream? Let me ask them. Well, I'm kind of shopping around. You know, there's Morgan Stanley, there's Goldman Sachs, there's IBM. Aha, I knew exactly why I was there that day, to get that job. Now, I get to the last interview on 9 West 57th Street, meeting with the big boss, overlooking Central Park on the 38th floor of 9 West, the Avon building, for those of you who don't know it. And this guy is impeccable, a beautiful man. We sit down, we have a great conversation. At the end of the conversation, he says to me, hey, Bill, I really appreciate this. This was an authentic, fantastic meeting, and I'm so happy we met. And the personnel department is gonna get in touch with you in a few weeks. I said, Mr. Fulwood, I don't think you completely understand the situation, sir. <laughs> he looked at me, his head kind of tilted. Well, what's the situation? I said, I have never broken a promise to my father in 21 years, and I can't start today. I gave my word that I was coming home with my employee badge in my pocket. I said nothing else. He told to his head again, Bill McDermott, as long as you have not committed any crimes, you're hired. <laughs> 35 years later, I was with him in Rochester, New York. He told me it was the first and only time he ever broke Xerox policy. And if you know Emerson Fullwood, you know that's true. So you gotta want it more. You know, that's it. You gotta have a winning dream and you gotta want it more. And the best thing I can tell you about the Xerox routine is this time, you know, where you, know, you have tasks, right? And everybody wants to be the boss, but sometimes you gotta really appreciate the details and the tasks. So leadership is about having visions and dreams, but also dealing with details and tasks. Funny story. You guys aren't in a rush, are you? <laughs> so I'm a trainee. I'm a trainee. I'm traveling with this guy, which means I was the gopher, right? So I get to carry the copy machine and the electronic typewriter up four floors in a brownstone in August in 95 degree heat. Not a pretty picture. I get up to the, the top floor. I walk into the brownstone. I can see the owner of the business. She's coming out of the back room. And all of a sudden, this huge cat jumps off the couch onto my shoulder. This was my second $99 suit. And I felt those claws go into my skin. And I'm thinking, forget the skin, man. There goes the $99 suit. So I held the cat, I petted the cat, and the woman looked at me and she said, you like cats? I do like cats. <laughs> we talked about the cat put the cat down very gently. Of course, the guy that's traveling with me that day can't wait to start doing a demo so we can make a pitch and get the sale. And I said, Bob, relax, we're talking about the cat, we'll be fine. And I said to her, Garfield has nothing on this cat. This cat's the deal. Because I knew that cat was the president of the company. I knew that cat was running things. So at the end, it's time to get the demo and make the sale. I take out a brochure. I said, if we were to demonstrate this and plug it into the wall, you, hit, you have to hit the green button and start. Do you need a demo? No, hon, I'll take two. We walk down, four flights of stairs, get to the curb, Bob says to me, boom. I just want to let you know something. You're either going to be the CEO of Xerox or you're going to jail. <laughs> now, I don't know what it is about this jail thing, but I actually managed to stay out of jail and 10 years later, I was called as a character witness because Bob was arrested in the sting operation. <laughs> they can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up. It's true. Then the final thing that I would just say to you, because we could all talk about highfalutin stuff. I got my first new business team when I was 24 years old. Xerox didn't do things like that. They were too mature for that. Too mature to give the youngest ones the chance. And all my competition was 30, 35, 40. They were ready. I wasn't. I was too young. I wanted more. So as they were playing the field, what's my salary? You know, how many guarantees can I get on my bonuses? And can I get a better office? I just like, I want this so bad. I'm just going to make it number one in the country. And I'm going to make you super successful. Just give me a chance. So I think this idea of wanting it more and really delivering the goods 
when you say you're going to deliver the goods, has a force multiplying effect. And that's what I learned from that Xerox Corporation. And it was amazing. And it all started on that Long Island Railroad ride when I read about the then CEO, David Kearns, who was reinventing the company on total quality management, a company that had been the first to a billion, the fastest market cap, and then it was collapsing. But Alita thought he could make it great again. And so did I. May it all be great. Thank you. Thank you. We look serious. This is going to be a tough one. No. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mark LaPritz. I interned in Palo Alto, actually, with Liam in the Start of Focus program. And so you've talked a little bit about your Delhi past and your past uh, work at Xerox. So what about SAP? What brings you to SAP? And like, what about this, uh, you've talked a lot about collaboration and leadership. I wanted to drop a little bit of innovation in there. Sure. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about design thinking. Um, where is SAP trying to take this design thinking, and where, how have you gotten here? How is that working? Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the question. I came in here in 2002, and at that time, uh, I was running the Americas for SAP, and at that time, they had five, what they called the CEOs of the Americas, in six years. So they were getting bounced out fast in baseball managers. And what I realized from the deli and from Xerox is, you guys lost track of the customer somehow. You're talking about technology, but you have to make it relevant to the customer. The customer, in the end, determines whether or not we have a job. And we got the whole company back on customer. Now, in terms of becoming the co-CEO and CEO of SAP, it was 2008, 2009. You all remember the financial downturn and the unbelievable economic crisis. Well, at that time, a CEO was appointed at SAP. But it didn't last too long, less than a year. Because at that very time that the world needed SAP the most, he had exacted a price increase that was highly unpopular. And then when the crowd screamed, uh, the idea was they'll get used to it because we deserve it because our competition is charging that, so we should too. So the idea of you know, doing something because you can is the perfectly wrong reason to do something. Do something because it's the right thing to do. And then if you make a mistake, quickly course correct it, say you're sorry, take ownership, and get on with it. So the first thing we did, obviously, in taking over in 2010 was change the price back, apologize, take ownership, and get on with it. But at that time, just on innovation, we were the number one business software company in the world, which is good. We were participating in 110 billion US dollar market cap market, which is good. But unfortunately, the world was changing very quickly. So we spent two weeks on strategy and innovation. And here was the big idea. If you look at the world, you're going to have 2 billion more people in the world by 2050. You're going to have another 800 million people in the world in that same time frame that are a lot older than the ones that are in the world today. So making the world run better and improving people's lives became the mantra. Because you had to get to the millennials, those individuals born between 1980 and 1993 represent the largest purchasing class of buyers in the world. And you had a planet that was going to have 9 billion people by 2050, and already the planet is getting sick, and the natural resources to serve the planet are absolutely scarce. So how are you going to create a sustainable world, a sustainable business model? Well, we looked at a couple of trends. One, mobility. There's more mobile devices in the world than there are toothbrushes. That was a reasonably good idea then to get into the mobile software world and go for that space because if it's not mobile, it doesn't matter. The second thing was big data analytics, which Villanova University is a role model on, because data is doubling in the world every 18 months with the internet of things. So if you don't have a handle on not just data, but information that turns into insight so you can own your consumer and take care of her better than anyone else was the absolute rallying cry of the company. And therefore, we made a huge invention, which you worked on, called SAP HANA, uh, the fastest in-memory database in the world. And of course, we also looked at the cloud. 
as a disruptive force because great companies have no interest in spending 90 cents on every dollar for hardware that doesn't matter. For services on that hardware that don't matter. Can you imagine any other industry that would blow 90 cents on every single dollar on something that doesn't matter? So to the extent that you could simplify things radically by applying cloud, big data, and mobile technology on a consistent core platform, we felt we could change the world. And now today, three years later, 80% of our revenues are coming from businesses we were not in at the beginning of 2010. So when you talk about leadership, leaders have to make tough calls and they have to work hard at seeing around corners using great data and great information, but also your gut. And that's huge. The second thing on this innovation curve is the pace of change. It's not just going faster. It's so breathtaking. On any given day, you can lose your breath thinking about it. And then on this subject of innovation, you have to collaborate and have an open ecosystem. If it's good for the customer, I'll partner with my biggest enemy. And that's the attitude. We have 70,000 people in our company. I have 2.1 million non-payroll jobs in the ecosystem supporting the SAP technology to help the customer be successful. Now you say, well, what's the big deal? What, what, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you think that China is the world's second largest economy, which I do, there's no way one company can absolutely fund China and all the other things. So we put 6,000 jobs in China, my ecosystem put 60. You want to go to the Middle East, you have all these young people that aren't getting jobs. And the government pays them to keep them busy because they pump oil out of the ground that we consume. But at some point, that's not sustainable. So we partner with government. The private sector partners an ecosystem to create all kinds of jobs for the young people. And they're beholden to the franchise called SAP because they get good jobs. And that, to me, is what really matters. You know, innovating, creating an open ecosystem, and collaborating, and then making the tough leadership calls. And having said all that, I think of us as a startup. When I think about the addressable opportunity in the open markets around the world, we have not even scratched the surface. And I think that's the way Villanova thinks. You know, it's like we're doing great, but you constantly come up with the next big idea that, have, that you've yet to even conceive. And probably in the next two years, we'll have to out-innovate what we did in the prior 42 to still be the company we are when I speak to you and answer your question tonight. That's how quick it's going to go. So I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, without, without all these PowerPoints, you know, we're actually having a real conversation. Isn't it nice? That's another rule. We don't do PowerPoints. You know, it's really nice to have a conversation, talk about the business, answer a few questions, and be authentic in real time. So thank you for the question. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions, but I'd be answer, happy to answer anything anybody else might want to ask. Anybody? I guess uh, am I might the last thing between you and the after dinner drink card. No, I want to say on behalf of and Ben, I want to say on behalf of on behalf of Anthony Reynolds, who I know has been your unbelievable day-to-day -day advocate here, and he keeps us all in line doing everything we can for Villanova University. SAP deeply respects Villanova University and what you guys are doing to run a world-class institution of higher learning, building great character and great leaders that will make this a much better world in the future. We're in your debt, and it's our honor to be your partner. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Jim Dolan, Class of 76 Art and Science alumnus and current CEO of the Voyager Group to the stage. Jim is a proud parent of three 
VSB students, Brian, 05 VSB, Peter, 07 VSB, and Charlie, who is currently with us, class of 14 VSB. We'll hear a little bit from Charlie tomorrow, as a matter of fact. I'd like to also thank uh, and welcome Jim's wife, Patty Dolan, for joining us this evening. So at, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Jim to join us to provide the benediction for the evening. We conclude our time together this evening with benediction. Philadelphia teaches its students and alumni the Augustinian virtues of veritas, unitas, caritas, truth, unity, and charity. Christ taught us the greatest of these is caritas. It is the essence of our Christianity. As business leaders, we are blessed with many gifts. The gift of opportunity, hopefully the gift of accomplishment, the gift of family, and the gift of our earthly success. But in all that, we are but stewards of our temporary successes here in this life. We are called to do more. We are to be instruments of good in this world and to bring God's love to others. St. Augustine said it this way, what does love look like? It has hands to help others. It has the feet to hasten to the poor and the needy. It has eyes to see the misery and the want. It has ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of men. That is what love looks like. So I invite you to join me in a closing prayer for our dinner program this evening. God, as we end this day together, we wish to thank you for the gifts you have given us. And we ask that you grant us the grace to see you in the material things we possess, the grace to recognize your face in the lives of those around us, and the grace to love the truth so passionately sought by St. Augustine, and the grace to live the charity which you commanded us. And we pray that Villanova University may continue to be a beacon of those virtues, veritas, unitas, and caritas, in a world so in need of your love. Amen. Thank you, Jim. This concludes this evening's program. Thank you again to Bill McDermott, Dan Hogarty.